So I have some animations in Python that I wanted to show you because I just really have a hard time drawing some things. And it, and it can kind of boil down to the difference between Laplace and Fourier, all right? So Laplace, right? We have the imaginary axis, which we usually just call J omega and the real axis, right? And this omega, you know, is, you know, we could say would be the test frequency as we go along that axis, right? But of course, uh, we can't really test negative frequency. So the Bode plot is really along this axis. But we have transfer functions for instance, let's use a low pass in um, standard polynomial form, right? But this can be rewritten as omega naught squared. And now, Here's the thing, um, we did where we just had real poles, but let's put in a complex pole, plus 0 All right, that's one. And then uh, the complex conjugate, that's the other. And we would plot this Well, actually blue is fine. Okay, like this, All right? When these were let's say S plus one, S plus 10, right? Well, if that's 0 0.707, one would be about here, 10 would be about there. And if we did omega naught squared S plus, I'm just gonna say 10 squared, Right, somewhere out at 10, we've got two, right? When we do the Bode plot, right, we find the magnitude of H of S, but H of S equals J omega and phase of S equals J omega. So this is a great two-dimensional plot, but it, what might be hard to see is that this pole means that come, if I take the positive direction as coming out of the screen, right? That means at this point, it's a pole, it's going to infinity. And if I put in some zeros, let's just say, you know, put a zero here and put a zero there, right? That means at that point, it's zero. But how this all ties together with the Bode plots and the Butterworth filter, I think might be a little bit, I'm gonna try some animations out with you and you let me know what you think.
battery's running low. Let me see if I can find um, another power supply. I'll, I'll, I'll throw it. All right, thanks. I'll bring it back. It, it's fine. Uh, let's see. Okay. Just kidding. All right, thanks. All right, so what we have is a three-dimensional plot. This right here is actually uh, the J omega axis. So looking this way would be our Bode plot, except when you take the log of the frequency, right, all of this becomes not a real number. And so really it's this quadrant. So our Bode plot would be like right here. But notice how these complex co uh, poles come in pairs, right? So you see this is going towards infinity. And I could make it go to, you know, much closer to infinity if I did a smaller step size. But in order to kind of see it, I kind of had to do a quasi uh, um, Bode plot where I did the Y axis still in DB, but I kept the um, the frequency axis still linear. All right. So this is what we, from this zero, from zero onward is our standard Bode plot, right? But these zeros, as they lift up, are pulling this up. Okay. If I were to rotate this, oh, I will rotate it like this. Uh, I didn't know it could rotate. Uh, well, here's the thing. Now you're looking straight on it and you can't, it kind of disappeared, right? And that's upside down. There we go. Well, that's because the, when we're doing those plots, the, the um, Right. Well, we are looking on it straight up. And the only thing that shows that this is going to infinity and that's going to zero is an X or a zero. Right. So when I just rotated it, that's kind of what you see. Oh, is there a, all right, no questions.
But what that is, just because we, actually I'll come back to it. Just because we do the magnitude and the phase response just in this one spot, in the Laplace domain, it's there everywhere, right? And of course, if we had poles um, on zero or greater, right, it'd be unstable. Now, yeah, the coefficients I chose were um, basically the Butterworth conditions. Now, what this plot is, is we have the transfer function. It's a low pass filter. Um, rather than linear, linear, I had to make the Y axis um, logarithmic, you know, it's dB, but you can see negative, this is negative frequency, this is positive frequency. And this is a low pass filter, but what's going on is I'm changing zeta, all right? So what's going on is I have a low pass filter. I'm keeping omega naught fixed. I have S squared plus two damping coefficient, omega naught S plus omega naught squared. So this is constant, 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 constant. S equals J omega. And this is going from like 0.01 to like two, all right? So it's going from the root, the, the poles are going to something where it's almost purely imaginary, right? To where it, it's, they're all real. But omega naught, isn't changing. Uh, it's going slowly. But notice, when it starts, it's really underdamped. That's because the poles are very close to the frequency axis here. So you see, you see that that kind of tendency to go to infinity, you see it, right? And it's happening very close to minus omega naught and plus omega naught. Then as the damping coefficient increases, you see that come down and then right there was the Butterworth where you had a flat, well you at home can't see, but you had a flat kind of response, right? And then you get this kind of odd shape where it's like, yeah, it's a low pass, but kind of like, what's the point? All right. So it gets a little bit hard to see what's going on, but what, what's happening in time is that we start off with poles so close that they're unstable so that going to infinity spot is right here. So you see this kind of, it dips, spikes, and that this is where I can't draw it, all right? Then, these, then they're moving away, then they're kind of coming down to where it's critically damp. Here, there's no, overshoot in the Bode plot, right? Then you have real two real roots and then they go that way, all right? So that's what's going on and it's just plotting both sides. 
Now, that can be hard to see. So, um, I did the same animation, but now it, I mean, it'll look great on my computer, but now these numbers are so small that it's hard to read. But you can see that it's logarithmic in frequency. It's logarithmic in, um, in gain, right? And so you can see that, that classic low pass filter. But when it'll start up, um, the root is almost so imaginary that it's almost on the omega, the, the imaginary axis, that the zero is going up right there, right? Then it right, now I don't think I'm hitting necessarily the, the Butterworth condition, but here's the thing, omega naught isn't changing. It's, a, it's, um, it's 10 the whole time, right? So when you see that um, big spike, you'll see that it happens right on 10. Then as the damping coefficient gets larger, the poles start to separate, right? Where now you can see a break here, you can see a break here, it's overdamped, right? And then notice right at the last moment, the higher pole is so far away that that looks first order just looking at it because the higher frequency pole is off the screen really. Okay. And all we're doing, uh, 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 what's up, Arta? See, I don't know if I can pause this. I'm still working on it. Or, you know what? I think it would be better to draw it, to show you what I mean. Okay. So here, right? Well, you can tell that it's got a complex pole because there's a resonance here, at least second order. If you were to look down here, you'd see minus four, 40 dB per decade, right? Then, at minus, and here's the thing, this spot is omega naught as it, essentially as, if I had this, right? These roots are purely imaginary. There's no real, right? Omega naught would be um, right at 10, right? And it would go to infinity right on the omega axis, right on the imaginary axis. Now here, omega naught occurs at minus 3 dB. That's going to give a damping coefficient of like, 0.707, just like system ID from a Bode plot, right? Now, if you did a Bode plot where it still looked like one root, it still looked like 40 dB per decade, the phase went from zero to minus 180, right? You calculate omega naught based on, right, where the phase is minus 190, uh, uh, 90 degrees, right? But if you're down 60 B, right? Oh, that's critically damped with one. 
Now, what happens when this is like 10? All right. So you start coming down. You see two breakpoints, all right? Minus 20 dB per decade, minus four dB per decade. Omega naught is somewhere in here, right? Where the phase is minus 90, all right? If my, so if my axis, you know, let's call this 100 kilohertz, right? But if this point is at 200 kilohertz, well, I see this, right? I never see the phase go to 180, right? Or let's, Let's make an even more extreme example. So zero minus 90 minus 180. but right here is the viewable area, that damping coefficient at about 10 does this. And if you don't take your LT spice simulation out far enough, or what if your oscilloscope only has a one megahertz bandwidth or the ones in 122 have a 70 megahertz bandwidth. If this pole is at a hundred megahertz, you might not, it might be there and you'd never see it. So it's effectively a acting first order. So yeah, a second order system with a huge damping coefficient could be approximated under some circumstances as a first order system, right? Because yeah, you don't know what you don't know and you can't, um, now, yeah, I think uh, my oscilloscope has, it goes up to 250 gig or something. I forget. No, that's, it's pretty fast, right? Some of these poles in LT Spice are out in the terahertz range, which, well, at terahertz, it's not, you're, you're, you got to use Maxwell's equations, right? You can't make circuit approximations anymore, but sometimes the way the modeling goes, it can pop up there, but really, you know, there could be other things going on here and you'd never know. Now, how could you know? Well, if you are testing with a step function, you're getting one over S, and you might see some strange things, right? Or you're doing an impulse response where, right, that's just one in the frequency domain, right? You're getting all frequencies. But um, what'll happen with your digital scopes is if you just take an FFT of a impulse response, right? You just measure where it goes to 3 dB, right? And that's the bandwidth of your scope. So anything past that, you just, you just don't know what it is, all right? But yeah, if you're down at 100 hertz and things like that, well, maybe, you know, a gigahertz isn't... Yeah, I think I only have two giga. 
Yeah, not 250. No, that, no, no, that's crazy. Because it think the device physics starts to change, right? Um, Now, this is that same transfer function, but up here, I start off with a damping coefficient so very close to zero to where we're almost on the imaginary axis. So this is, this is the imaginary axis, right? This is the real axis. I'm just not showing the positive area. So I start off with poles here. It's practically resonating. Then at 0 0.707 or 45 degrees, right, that's the Butterworth coefficients. You kind of get a flat pass band, but it is under damped. So if I don't reiterate it later, you can have a flat pass band in a Bode plot, but still have a little bit of overshoot in the transient. Right, then right here, there, there'd be two equal poles, critical damping. And then what it is, one, pole, one set of poles is going this way and the other set of poles is going this way. So this is getting closer and closer to zero, right? And this is getting closer and closer to infinity. And this and this are a pair of poles, all right? But this is gonna dominate your response because it'll start filtering down here at this lower frequency than up here, all right? And yeah, wherever there's an X, that's where it's going to infinity and you're kind of raising up whatever's going on over here. Now, the thing is, is you can design your filters this way, right? Now, remember I said, oh, we can put a pole here and a pole here, right? And if these are, you know, scaled by 0 0.707, that's the Butterworth. And that makes, um, minus three dB at omega naught. Okay. If it's minus six dB at omega naught, then you've got two roots here. Now the thing about the Butterworth is a lot of you are coming to me and you're doing a third order, right? So what you do is well what? Uh, 180 divided by 3 is 60, right? So you got 60 degrees between these, right? So you got one is real and two complex right? Because complex poles always come in pairs, right? So if you have a third order system, yeah, one could be one, you could have a complex set and then one real. And if you're doing fourth, well, then you kind of evenly distribute these along a circle, right? A fifth, you'd evenly distribute it and put a real one there. A sixth, you'd put six there and up to eighth order, right? And yeah, you can just use Python and it'll spit out the constants for you, all right? Um, now, 
Now the thing is, is they do do an example. Where I want to make a notch filter, which means I want to A notch filter, you don't want any of the target frequency to get through, right? So if I put this at, you know, J60 hertz minus J60 hertz, right? I should have a zero there. But if I plot this, if I kind of do the Bode plot, Well, it's kind of a stinky picture. In fact, I can't do a Bode plot, not only because of the negative frequency, but if I only have a zero here, it's zero right here and, the, and it won't, and a Bode plot, when you take the, put it into dB, it'll choke, right? So this, while it is a notch filter, Notice the gain is changing as you go up in frequency and you get this strange thing here. Well, what you do is you put a zero really close. And of course, the closer it is, the sharper, I mean, the closer this is, so this is going to zero, this is going to infinity. And what you can get is this shape. All right. Now, um, So uh, a lot of this is, again, the book never goes over Bode plots, but magnitude, that's magnitude, that's phase, right? And you can see you get these shapes rather than those asymptotic kind of straight lines, but. So there is an, the way I've been presenting the transfer functions, it's in polynomial format. S to the S cubed plus something S squared plus something S plus some constant, right? That's the A's and B's constants from DF2, right? But you can do it in pole zero format, all right? And yeah, here's the transfer function. And this is just, 
this symbol means multiply everything together instead of the sum symbol. It just means uh, multiply. All right. So let's just get another, we're looking at this another way. So if I have two zeros, right, it's really one pair of complex zeros, right? If it was, if alpha was totally zero, right, then that zero would happen on the omega axis. This is the omega axis. It doesn't go to zero, so alpha is, um, alpha is not zero, right? Now is it, in this case, notice omega naught is one. The minimum is occurring near one, but not exactly at one, and alpha is point, point 0.5. All right. Now, when alpha gets smaller, that means the real part is getting smaller. Right? So here, alpha was 0.5, right? So that's like out here, or these are, sorry, it's out here. These are zeros, right? Then it keeps getting closer, right? So 0 0.1, that zero is almost on the axis, right? Here it's 0.1, it's just almost there. But then if I make it bigger, right, then this kind of, these zeros are so far away that it's going to just kind of be flat. All right. Now, yeah, here is, there is no real part. The zero is at omega naught one radian per second. And you're just right here and right here and it touches down. And you could think of this as, as that not that crappy notch filter, right? Oh, at one radian per second, it's totally zero. But all the other, some frequencies are going to be multiplied by three, some by 2.5, some by two. Then in between, it's a mishmash, right? And, um, okay, so now let's look at two poles. Now, why isn't this going exactly to one? That's because I'm not putting omega naught up here squared. Right, so with poles, it's different. It's trying to go, go to infinity, right? But alpha's one, so right, it's up one, over one, over one, down one, right? So this spot where it's going to infinity isn't exactly near. So you're kind of getting this flat response, right? But notice alpha is getting closer to the omega axis. And now it's starting to look like it's getting towards infinity. 0 0.005, yeah, it's, you're seeing that resonant peak. Remember, the Bode plot is just this part. And you, you know, you scale this logarithmically and take the TB gain. Now, yeah, you can do these uh, kind of filters and say, I want this many zeros. So there's a zero at plus or two, uh, plus or minus 2J. Notice, plus or minus 2J, and it touches zero. Then there's another one at j plus or minus j4, but there's a little real part to it. So it's a little bit higher, right? Now for the poles, I have minus 0.5 plus or minus one, right? So here's my one. It's, it doesn't go towards infinity because there's a real part to it. 
right? And the real part is in fact negative. Then I have the same thing, the same real part here and here and so on and so on. If we looked like this, all right, so plus or minus 2j, so I have a zero here and here at plus two minus two. Then I have one, another one at four, and it's just a little to, bit to the side, all right? Point one minus j four. Point one my, plus j four. Okay, now for the zeros, uh, uh, poles. So I have 0.5, I'll come over a little bit, plus or minus j here. Then again, I got plus or minus 0.5 again, so I'm still in the same spot, but I'm at three. So that's minus one, minus three, plus one, plus three j. And then I go up to five. So that was four, all right, then I'll have them there. And this is the kind of filter you get. Now, you might say that is the craziest looking filter I have ever seen. But you might, there's more than just Butterworth filters. Okay, now some of these, yeah, I have to draw. I can't draw a Bode style because if it goes to zero, but you might have filters, comes out here, sharply goes, and then bounces down, right? And even though this is bouncing. Well, hey, what if you were filtering some signal, right? You had the Fourier transform, Fourier coefficients were at these minima here. Well, that could be perfect. And notice you can get this, sometimes you can get this slope super sharp at the expense of a ripple here or the fact that you're getting this kind of bit of residence. All right. So the Butterworth filter basically distributes the zeros in a circle so that you get a flat response and then you get um, a sharp, sharp curve here. But you can get sharper than that depending on the kind of filter. There's elliptical, there's all these names, they're right there. But yeah, I mean, you could come up with your own set of coefficients and one day I'll be teaching the King filter. He was right here. And he always told me to, to make sure to turn on the recording. And he came up with his own filter. I'm not kidding, right? It could happen. And I would say that. I would totally say that if that happened. So let's come back to the notch part. So notice now I'm trying to make a real notch filter. I think that's 60 hertz. Yeah, that's 60 hertz. So I've got it zero and zero, but you don't want to, if the frequencies are higher than 60, well, we're multiplying it. And in between, we're still multiplying it, right? So that's what I'm saying. We got to add those zeros so that now look, it's a notch here, very sharp, but everything else is kind of passed with a one. Okay, and then yeah, um, you know the the book shows you a fifth order Butterworth filter. That's the one I did in the video, right? Um, for the low pass filter, and there is something I it, it might be a little off topic, but I I think you're gonna want to know it. So. Let's say I have designed 
my um, I'm just going to use an example of a second order low pass Butterworth. Okay. Minus four DDB per decade. Um, omega naught. Minus three DB. Now I'm just going to redraw this a little bit. Notice this no peak, right? But complex poles, right? You can't tell how the only way is that if this is minus 3 dB, right, at omega naught, right, minus 40 dB per decade, phase zero to minus 180 degrees. So you know it's a second order system, right? But you're at minus three dB at omega naught, right? Now, yeah, or minus uh, four or minus five or now minus, the thing is, is it'll start to resonate, right? So the thing is, is that means there's complex poles And the step response, right, the Butterworth filter has a detectable overshoot in the time domain, but it's flat in the frequency domain, okay? So you can have complex poles with no resonant peak here in, the, in a Bode plot, right? And yeah, um, it might be undetectable, but it will overshoot a little bit in the time domain if you have complex poles. And So this is just a simple first order filter, zero to 90 minus 20 dB per decade. All right, but something, um, how do I get the step response, right? Well, this simulation is set up for, um, well, let's just simulate, uh,
Now, the thing is, is why is it jagging up and down like that? That's because the clock is going at 100 kilohertz um, in this simulation. But notice that the average will end up to be half a volt. And this is the ripple you're, in fact, measuring, right? And um, so the thing is, is let me find... Um, right that's the clock frequency right so in order to get the step response you've got to have the um you got to slow that clock down this is it acting like a um pulse width modulated filter and yeah it's taking that long to settle now yeah if you go for 0.1 millisecond in, in this particular example, it should work. But another way is if you, um, we go back to our Bode plot, right? You know, Here's the thing, this is just a first order filter. And so the minus 3 dB point is at 10 kilohertz and that's really where F naught is in this particular example. All right, that's where the action is. So, so one period would be one over 10 kilohertz, but sometimes you kind of got to go a little bit longer. So really what I would do is I'm just saying, no, let me just, I'm just gonna keep it on for one, but I'm not gonna simulate that long. So it's on for a second, but when I go to simulate, I'm like, well, one over 10K, all right, that's 0.1 million. All right, let me, let me do 10 times that. So let me simulate for a millisecond, all right. Okay, so I get the rise time there. Now, yeah, maybe I don't need to go that long, right? I can cut the simulation time down, right? But um, I just wanted to show you a trick.
Now, you'd think, hey, what this was, was the derivative of the step which should give you the impulse, right? And in my video, I'll say, divide this into this and it should work. But um, sometimes it just numerically doesn't work. And, it, um, and yeah, you might say, oh, well, the scale's off. No, something happens, it's just, it just doesn't work. All right, now how can you get the Bode plot out of that? Well, just plot the output and then you know some things, All right? Based on other things, you know that it's a low pass filter, right? You know that at DC, the gain is zero, right? So if I'm not getting a gain of, at zero, well, what, are, what am I getting? Hmm. Well, I should be getting a gain of one, but I'm getting a gain of 1.43K. All right, well, let's just scale it. All right, now notice that that kind of looks like that plot, right, where it's you know, you'd see the, the other side of it, the negative frequency side. All right, now we just put it back into, and there we go. There's our low pass derived from the FFT, even though trying to divide it by the impulse response isn't that great. Now, yeah, um, it works great for low pass, um, high pass, well, the FFT brings it down anyway, so you might have to take a spot and say, oh, that's zero dB, or you knew what the gain should be and scale it by that. But it's kind of a hack, but it works, All right? Or load it into uh, Python and, and you can calculate it that way. But FFT, yeah, can kind of be numerically difficult. Now, yeah, if you knew what another way is, well, you know, well, Megan, uh, uh, the, the, the frequency is 10 kilohertz. So you measure the Bode plot here, you measure it here and a few points around here, and I measure a few points here, and then curve fit it, right? Because if you're trying, let's say you're, you're making a low pass, this low pass filter as part of a product and you need to verify it, right? Um, you need to come up with a test that does the bare amount to verify that that DAC will work because um, sometimes testing costs has to be kept to within three cents apart. I mean, it, it boggles your mind mine but what i figure is is you've got this whole automated system it's all written in python by the way you press go and it just does it right so um now you might have noticed that i have a video written on a paper bag That was an emergency, but the information is nonetheless still good. Now, I want this to be an open-ended project, right? So choose filter, right? Now I could say minimize the number of op amps or minimize the bandwidth or maximize the bandwidth or do this and do that. It's whatever you want to do, right? So you could say, no, it's got, minimum got to be second order, right? But you can do it any way you want, right? Um, although I think, I think you might have to do a DF2. 
Do not use Salon and Key. That's just a bad filter topology for this. It, I don't want to get into it, but man, I got bit. So if we do the Fourier coefficients of a pulse train, right? Well, we have our, uh, That's the DC we want. Now understand, this is actually changing over time, right? Except it's changing a lot smaller than the bandwidth of our filter. So, you know, that's how you get music out of it, right? But then, right, we get these resonant peaks that we don't want, right? Well, what we want to do is keep right, this part, and get rid of that. Now, yeah, on a Bode plot, it would kind of look like this. But the sharper we make it, you know, the better it'll be. But yeah, there could be, like, what if you came up with some filter that kind of had a minimum there? Now, unfortunately, these things move around based on the um, the pulse width, but it's just a consideration. But the low pass means all these other parts that are changing in time, we're trying to get rid of, right? And if I did a high, if I did a band pass, right? I would actually, that's how I could get a sine wave out, right? Let's say I say, I want a sine wave and you, you're getting this, well, do a band pass centered around the frequency you want. And then the, lo and behold, you'll get something very close to a sine wave, All right? If you want some kind of maybe a random signal, random looking, well then yeah, maybe you would do a high pass, but that means all the high frequency parts are getting let through. And the, the DC part you want is being blocked. Right, so no, it's all gotta be low pass. Otherwise, it's not a PWM DAC, right? But I see a lot of third. I did fifth, right? You just can't do mine with my constants, right? You could pick your own, fine, right? It's just come up with your own filter. Now, yeah, you can do a choose, um, I guess some people are um, psi pi filter. It's not part of this. Butterworth is the one we're talking about. But we got uh, Chebyshev, Chebyshev 2, Elliptical, and Bessel Thompson. And it, if all you do is change it in the code from Butter to one of these, it'll show you the Bode plot. Now, yeah, if... Now, here's the thing. Some of these filters have a resonant peak, right? And then come down. But you know what? It, you say, oh, well, that's, that's bad. Well, the step response will have a lot of overshoot, sure. But if your fundamental frequency is way away from that, at least it won't amplify it. Because what if you put your fundamental omega one 
right there. Well, it's going to amplify it and make it worse. But um, it's up to you. All right. I, I guess that's pretty much it for today. Um, we really uh, we're coming to the end. We just want to talk a little bit about modulation and things like that. We, I don't, I don't do the last day. Let's do a quiz. All right. But um, I try to make it so that we can answer review questions and not, you know, a little bit. Okay. We do have to talk about modulation. All right. Um, I got to look it up, but it, you know, I follow, I follow the schedule. Now. Yeah. If, um, if you're the, if you've got three exams on one day, I always will go on the makeup day cause I'm there anyway. Right. So you don't have to ask around. I will make another exam for you for the makeup day. All right. All right, I see no questions online. Uh.